Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And this is the Industrial Design Podcast by us. <laughs> <laughs> that should have beca- become the official tag. We actually had some taglines come in. We did have some taglines come in. Thank you to Graham Wilson. Um, oh, uh, he, he said, what was the tagline? He had like, hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we talk about nitty gritty industrial design. Where we get into the nitty gritty of industrial design. Um... Or the podcast that gets into the nitty gritty, mm. uh, or it asks the hard hitting questions, or it takes a closer look. Mm, okay, this is very getting very serious. Yes, uh, it sounds like investigative journalism. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I was thinking about. I, I think I've kind of mentioned this before, but the way that I think about our podcast is uh, it's it's recording those late night design studio conversations that you can never get back why didn't we call it late night nick and james (laughs) (laughs) but you know you like i I remember so many times in school like having those late night studio conversations where you seem to have uncovered all the mysteries of the universe and you know those are the good old days and and you can never have them back and and this is our way of recording those thoughts Mm -hmm. now what you find out is a lot of those thoughts are really dumb yeah and maybe you shouldn't have recorded them (laughs) but there's some there's some gold in those minds yeah a podcast is just our our word thoughts coming out mind (laughs) mind thoughts it's not good there's there's our tagline (laughs) minor details mind thoughts coming out (laughs) um how you been james also i i asked that kind of mm, kind of in the way of we spent the past three days together already so Mm -hmm. i'm already tired of talking to james yeah two days and that's how tired you are of of talking to me um yeah we've been working together this week uh once again um and uh putting in a little time on that that uh secret project we're working on secret it's client project yeah it is uh but it's it's a lot of fun and it's and it feels like it's coming together yeah we're i'm getting i'm getting excited about it yeah well we will definitely do a podcast about it one day once the product is released yeah um because i know you guys are really eager to know what it is yeah once yeah once i once i sign on the dotted line for my third home yes that's that's just kind of project this is (laughs) um but um but yeah i mean uh as far as what's going on with me i am i am Going to Italy. James, didn't you just go to vacation? Just go on vacation? Just go to vacation? <laughs> I went to vacation. It wasn't that great. It wasn't as good as everybody says it is. Um, but but this time I'm going to Italy. That's awesome. Um, are you excited? Yeah, I'm very excited. Uh, you know, my parents are um, taking my wife and I. I have been complaining for years that uh, they took my sister's when I was in high school and they left me behind. Like Home Alone? Uh, home Alone with my grandmother. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so not as not as lonely. Right. I, and I wasn't uh, fending off burglars. Got it. Okay. Um, you know, uh, but um, yeah, so going to Italy for about a week and a half. You're going to drink a lot of espresso? I, oh man. Drive some Lamborghinis I'm, I'm around? I'm going to get wired and tired. Drinking espresso and shoveling down pasta. <laughs> Um, I, um, I've bought a lot of sweatpants okay. that, that are like XXL. Right. So you can expand so into I'm them. I'm just going to fill. Yeah. I'm just going to fill in. That's a good goal. Very good goal. Yeah. No, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think it's a, it's a good goal. It's an accomplishable goal. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it should be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it and I'm looking forward to just, uh, you know, I've gone to a number of countries in Europe, but I haven't gone to Italy. And, and it's always interesting to go to a place where you know a lot of the design work that comes out of it, but you don't know necessarily the culture yeah. from where it comes from. I mean, you know, you have Milan, which yeah. is, you know, Milan Design Week is essentially the largest design week there is. Yeah. Um, 
So I just want to see where, you know, my current hero, Stefano Giovannoni. Right, the designer, know, he does a lot of Alessi stuff. Yeah, I just uh, I want to see, you know, what what his surroundings were like, what what it is, what's going on in Italy that makes makes them so, you know, whimsical and uh, and also elegant. I think it's the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Probably. It's got some magic powers. Yeah. I think it's just the copious amounts of pasta and espresso, but... Mm, that's a factor, too. Yeah. But that's uh, that's about it for me. That's good. What, that's good. What about you, Nick? I, I saw I saw a, a dizzying time lapse. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, last week, we talked about my sketch cam yeah. that I was building. You know, essentially a way that I can record my sketchbook on the go, anywhere I am, with my phone. Now, Nick, can I ask you a, a probing question about this? Yes. Some investigative journalism, some hard-hitting I'm ready investigative for it. journalism. I'm ready for it. Do you even sketch while you're walking? No. Is that a thing you ever do? No, I've never sketched while I was walking. Okay. Um, and I got to the core of that pretty <laughs> quickly. That's the kind of quality journalism but, that we do. But, but I have sketched on the train before. Yes. And on the train, it is difficult. I mean, you, it's almost impossible to just record your phone while you sketch on the train i mean record your notebook while you sketch so i was like right. well what if i could record it and so i built this whole kind of contraption 3d printed it out you can check it out on my instagram um and it needs some work i found some tweaks that i can make to it um it's an interesting concept altogether i'm not exactly sure how i feel about using it especially when people are just like looking at me really weird walking down the street but they do you're, that. They do that anyways. Yeah, so. you're living in New York City. I, I mean, people might might look at you weird, but that's about the extent yeah, of it. They won't bother you. They're not gonna like go to the police. Mm -mm. Um, you know, you well, I mean, you should take that countdown clock off of <laughs> off of it. Yeah, so it doesn't look like a bomb. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's a but, little. But uh, but other than that, I think I don't know. You can. I've thought this oftentimes when I'm on the subway. Like I could literally lay down on the seats. And people, people would just be like, well, okay. Yeah, they wouldn't tell you to sit. They wouldn't tell me to sit up. Yeah. They wouldn't, I don't know. I mean, it depends on how scruffy you look. I yeah. Mean, no, you just turn, you just turn over, oh, face down. Okay. Oh, just like, like you died. Well. Like a dead body. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you don't want to alarm people. Okay. Yeah, you know, so face down, loud snoring, so they know you're alive. Got it. Um, it's a yeah. good way to, good way to get a seat on the, the train. Yeah, catch a few, few extra Z's on yeah. the way to work. Quick tip. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but but my sketch cam thing was cool. I mean, it. I don't know. I might keep working on it. I might not. I don't yeah. know. We'll see what happens. I love. I love the the idea. I love the you know just you had the idea, you made it. Yeah. You you. I mean, you proved it out. It's just like an experiment. You know. Yeah. I don't. I didn't know if it would work or not. Um. But yeah. I'm. I don't know. I might pick it back up or but not. That's what people love about your Instagram, Nick. The experiments. That's true. That's what I. That's what I love. That's true. And I speak for the majority of your followers. Thanks, James. Thanks. I've been elected a representative. Um, I'm also working on the Patreon thing, mm -hmm. and it's getting closer to launch. Essentially, I've recorded the past two chair sketches in the past late night, Nick, and I'm excited. Yeah. Uh, we'll see how that turns out as well. So stay tuned for that. I'll figure out the launch thing in a bit, but it's coming. Okay. I would say within the next week and a half or so. Yeah. Is there going to be a ribbon cutting ceremony? Um, like in front of your laptop screen? No. But I could cut like ribbons if I needed to. I don't know. <laughs> oh, man. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think that's all I've been up to. Yeah, we we've been working hard on our on our uh, freelance yeah. gig. So well, I saw you were you uh, went to s the super good thing sample sale this weekend. Oh, I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went to good thing sample sale. Picked up a few things. Good thing is a, a houseware kind of everyday product company. Um, very inspired by their their work. They you know they produce really unique and well thought out products. Yeah, um, and yeah. affordable. I would say very affordable too. And so I, I've, you know, I take a lot of inspiration from them for my brand, Almost Object. So, uh, you know, I admire their stuff. Picked up a few things. Check them out if you haven't. Yeah. It's just called Good Thing. And then their, all their handles are usually Super Good Thing. Oh. So I think Instagram is at Super Good Thing and www.supergoodthing.com. Okay. But, but yeah, that was good. Cool. Um. Another thing that happened this week, maybe this is like design news, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, 
today, while we're recording this podcast, I woke up and 10 people had messaged me and said, Nick, did you see this guy? He made this lamp and he copied you. And I'm like, well, what? What are you guys talking about? So I check it out. And so there's this student. Actually, they had got reposted on this Instagram called at student de- dot design. Yeah. They just post student work. And they posted one of Ed Heritage's projects. Um, and it's a light. And I don't know if you guys have listened to all the episodes or not. I think we talked about the lamp. Yep. My infamous lamp that I designed back in one of the beginning episodes. Um, essentially, it looks like a triangle. And you tilt it back and forth and it turns on and off. And so Ed had designed this lamp that looked very similar um it looks like a triangle kind of a flat triangle Mm -hmm. sits on the desk and then it has a large sphere or orb maybe about the size of a grapefruit or a melon a cantaloupe (laughs) um and then on one side and then on the other side it has a steel ball Mm. so essentially you just you know push the steel ball down and the globe turns on Mm. so it you know essentially it had Essentially, it was my design plus a light-up ball on top. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people were saying, like, Nick, what are you going to do about this? Like, he copied you and stuff. But this is the thing. This is the rub. Like, I, I hate when people start accusing other people of copying when, in fact, they just made their own thing that right. maybe was inspired by mine. Maybe it's not. A lot of designers can come up with the same ideas. Yeah. Uh, It's a very common thing, more common than you think. Um, You know, I I think about designing that project, and, you know, if if your prompt was to design a lamp that turns on and off in a unique way, you would iterate a hundred different ways to turn on and off a lamp. And one of those ways is inevitably going to be rocking back and forth. Yeah. And, of course... The best way to rock back and forth on a very simple form is having an, a very flat, obtuse angle that looks like a triangle. Yeah. And so it's it just, you come to the same a, a, uh, conclusion. Right. Um, yeah, there's only so many solutions out there. Right. So, I mean, you guys can check out Ed Heritage work. I actually really like what he did. I thought his design was way bo- more elevated than mine. Mm. I felt like the, the sphere on top really felt... Um, I felt like there was a lot more hierarchy going on. Mm-hmm. You know, mine was a simple triangle, and yeah. he added that hierarchy of the lighting up of the sphere. Hmm. See, I would disagree with you there. Nothing against Ed's project because I think it's nice, but I think the delightful aspect of your project is the fact that when it's off, it you, like you you might not know what it is. Mm, interesting. And then when you tilt it, like there's this element of surprise and delight of like, wow, this is a lamp. This is this is really cool because his is more feels more like a lamp. Like, right. Immediately you see it. You see the bulb. You see the globe. Uh, I think there was a bulb in the globe, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You would if you saw it unlit, you would think that it's still a lamp because I just, uh, yeah, I think that the fact that yours is a bit more hidden mm-hmm. makes it more successful, in my opinion. This is, this is you know, just in general, the things that I'm drawn to are things that um, kind of surprise and delight. Yeah, no, I, I can see that point. I don't know if that makes mine better or, or I, I think some people would argue that it's worse, though, as well. Some people would argue that because they don't know what the object is that it's a bad yeah design. but i mean you're bu- you're gonna buy say that this is a something on the shelf right, like, right, right. or something that you've you've seen advertised mm-hmm. you know what it is when you buy it like then but then there's this like moment where you're setting it up and you tilt it for the first time and it glows or you sh- or you show it to mm. somebody else yeah like there's that moment mm-hmm. um because i you know i think that uh like if you were to purchase your lamp, you would already know. I guess that's what true. it does. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So it is more of a, uh, I, almost like a, like when guests guests come over, they're like, "What is that?" And you're like, "Oh, it's this." And you're like, <laughs> "What?" 
Yeah, and you mm. immediately get much more interesting, and then more friends come to your next party. You know, more people come because they're like, "Oh my god, you got to come see Nick's lamp. It's amazing." <laughs> That's never happened before, but uh, hopefully one day it will now. <laughs> it will now. Um, yeah, I, I just thought that was interesting. I I really want to push the fact that just because a design looks similar to another design doesn't mean that it's a copy. Right. I if people. I think it's just young students don't understand this. I, I yeah. think more veteran designers understand that design is built on generations of right. products. Uh, we take inspiration from everything we see in our day, uh, throughout our day. You know, I think about Apple taking inspiration from Braun. Right. Um, and yeah, it's it's not a ripoff. It's not a copy. It's just there's great design out there and we're building off of it. Yeah, I think there's a legacy, there's an evolution. Mm -hmm. Um, I think as long as it's not a replica, as long as there's a sense of some sort of evolution, then I think it's fine. I 100% agree. And for Ed's lamp, I mean, I agree that it's a great evolution. Maybe you disagree, but yeah. I do disagree. (laughs) I actually... (laughs) Nothing against Ed. I don't know if Ed listens to this. He probably doesn't. I think he's uh, he goes to some London school, mm. um, and he's getting his master's. So this is a master's project. Cool. Um, but I don't know. Someone someone who knows Ed probably listens to this, right? I guess so. I would like. Maybe. I would hope so. I mean, it's just uh, it is funny to me that that back to back weeks, you know, like me with the Logitech mouse, <laughs> you with the lamp. But but yeah, I mean it, it's. <laughs> Yeah, Logitech didn't copy. And I don't think Ed copied me either. No. But I would be interested to hear Ed's thoughts on whether or not he saw my lamp at some point and subconsciously remembered it. Yeah. I think that ha- that happens very often. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. we're, uh, f- speaking for myself, I'm on Pinterest yeah. a lot. I'm we on Lemonouche. Con- we consume so much. We do. We consume so much imagery, and it's hard for that not to seep into your work. Right, right. Um, but, so, but that's how, that's how the evolution works, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, reach out to us, Ed, if you're listening, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Um, this week wanted to talk about design thinking yeah. as our topic. And I, I've been kind of pondering this one for a while, James. I design thinking for those of you who don't know is essentially, utilizing the design process for a wide breadth of issues doesn't necessarily mean designing a physical product um you know design thinking could be applied to a business situation Mm -hmm. or some sort of environmental problem um you know design thinking is just the practice of using the design process to solve a problem Mm -hmm. that's really the general definition of it um in my opinion and i think it's It's a buzzword that gets tossed around a lot, and I just wanted to talk about maybe the uses of it, the validity of it, why 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 we use it, or or what we use it for. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you've had any experience with design thinking specifically, James. Uh, I can't say I can't say that I have. I mean, I've definitely, on touching on something we were talking about in the last podcast, companies, you know, sort of um, saying that they're going to be more design focused. Right. You know, and, and then that just basically being nothing more than just language and not action. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I've come into contact with the most. Yeah. But um, I don't know that I've ever been... Uh, in a situation where it's some sort of like internal corporate workshop on design thinking and how it can be an asset. Right, right. So I I have been to those workshops. Okay. And not necessarily that they were in a corporate corporate atmosphere, but there are design thinking workshops. um, And I've been to some. And I think, you know, at SCAD, we were taught a little bit of design thinking uh, just in general, what it is and how it's used. Um, but here, here's my biggest, I guess, beef with design thinking, right? Mm-hmm. Design thinking is just design. Mm-hmm. It's this buzzword that uh, whatever PR company created, actually, I think 
Did what? IDEO create Was it IDEO? Thing? I'm pretty I sure feel it's like IDEO. it was probably IDEO. Oh, man. Um, it, it's, it's something that they just created to implement into bigger corporations, bigger businesses to, to kind of, I almost think, just to get more business. Sure. Because IDEO is probably thinking like, oh, these businesses don't need products. They just need to restructure their distribution system. Right. So why don't we help right. design their distribution? So it gets into the strategy yeah, it's, aspect. It's very much strategy design. But I mean, isn't, you know, isn't design thinking um, just mostly about... When I think of design thinking, I think generally like if I were to... Uh, sort of like put a caricature on it it would be like the post-it note Mm. so yes you know yes that's all design thinkers do are just post-it notes everywhere so it's it's a it's a lot about um like generating a lot of ideas and then like iterating on ideas and Mm. testing and i mean I don't, I guess I don't have as much of a (laughs) a beef a beef with this topic because I feel like you know, there are a lot of disciplines um, outside of design that don't necessarily, maybe they don't engage in this type of exercise. Yeah. And and don't you think that there's value in, in the exercise of just, you know, getting to that brainstorm session? Because, you know, if you've ever brainstormed with anybody who is not a designer, there are times where they like they either clam up like they're they're afraid to share yeah their ideas definitely they're afraid because because they're afraid of the backlash of like Mm -hmm. if it's a bad idea right um or you get somebody in there who is the like who is like sort of um saying you know, shooting people, shooting people's ideas right. down. That's you a, get, you get like kind of both of those camps. That's a bad brainstorm. Actually, maybe we should dive into this because, because brainstorming is part of design thinking. Right. Um, you know, essentially design thinking is brainstorming about all kinds of ideas to solve the solution that you're, you're trying or solve the problem that you're trying to, uh, uh, solve, solve, the yeah. problem. solve, solve the, the problem, problem. <laughs> solve the problem that you're trying to solve. Yes. Um, that's right. And so uh, a lot of techniques, there's a lot of techniques to do that, but I think the biggest technique is getting a group of, you know, marketing people, business people, anyone that's involved into one room and yeah. brainstorming. And the key with brainstorming, and this is goes with any design process, is you need to have that on and off phase. Like you need to have the phase where there are oh, no-nos, there's only... Yes, that's a good idea. Or, mm-hmm. or the yes and, right? Yes like, and, yeah. Um, Improv comedy 101. Exactly, exactly. So a bad brainstorm coordinator would be would be someone who doesn't explain that well. Yeah. And people are saying, oh, no, that's not a good idea. Don't do that. Yeah. Because that's not the stage where you do that. You know, brainstorming is all about churning out as much content and ideas that you can. Bad ideas, great ideas, any of the ideas in between. Just yeah. put them up on the wall. Because here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, James, is that if you had a bad idea, then I would see that bad idea, and I'd be like, well, I know that's bad, but what if you did this? And yeah. then we turn it into a great idea. You see the good and the bad. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, what what does what does make for a good brainstorm? You know, what, what sort of, um, like, setup and, and how is it conducted? He- Brain brainstorming is almost like a game of Dungeons and Dragons. It's it is brainstorming <laughs> does feel like a game, doesn't it? It feels like everyone gets in the room and like, all right, guys, we're gonna brainstorm. Yeah, well, it's like, and there's the dungeon master, and they are leading the brainstorm. This is and, yeah, this is a good topic or a good conversation to have because we don't really talk about brainstorming a lot, but it is something that is almost a crucial part to the design process in its infancy. Yeah. Um. You know, that initial stage of just coming up with as much content. I know one thing that helps me, and I'm super, I've been in some great brainstorming sessions and I've been in some bad brainstorming sessions. Mm. The great ones, everyone has a pad of paper and a Sharpie. And you draw a picture and you write. Now you can't, my rule, 
what I like to do is that you can't just write words. You have to draw some sort of imagery. Right. And whether that's, you know, if you can only draw hearts, draw a heart, you know, a box, draw a box. But draw something that helps explain your idea and helps almost I, I create an icon for right. your idea. Um, but then the bad brainstorming sessions are where no one has pieces of paper and maybe there's one person up there on the whiteboard just writing oh, down ideas. Interesting. Now, it, it reminds me of um, back in my college days. Uh, so there was this thing that they installed when I was in when I was at Virginia Tech called the Kiva. And the Kiva was developed by Is this guy. Is this a guy. smart whiteboard thing? It's no, no, no. Okay. Uh, so it was developed by this this um, professor from Carnegie Mellon, Joe Ballet, who um, he also developed the form families that um, Reed and I used. Oh, right. In we that talked about that. We session. talked about that a while back. So the Kiva was essentially uh, a round room. It was a round room like smack dab in the middle of our studio. I've seen images online, Google yeah. images, yeah. Yeah, so basically the idea was is that you have sort of like the never-ending brainstorm board or like iteration whiteboard, that's, you know? That's really interesting. Yeah. Wow. Um. Hmm. So, and there was also weird things that happened in the Kiva. If you stood in the middle of it, you sounded like God, but only <laughs> to you, like nobody else heard it. Right. Um. But, uh, but yeah, it was this round room. And, and yeah, so the idea was just like, um, so that there's just kind of no boundaries and no limits and, you know, corners and, or anything. It's, it's mostly fluid. Um, like it's a fluid uh, generation process. Right. Um, and, but I do seem to remember like being in brainstorm sessions and one, people, one person having the marker and then other people saying things. Right. And, uh, yeah, I, I would say that, like, from my experience, that that isn't necessarily the best way to brainstorm. Here, here, if you guys are ever in that experience, grab the marker. Because the per- I always say the person with the pen has the power. Right. And it's very true because you get to record. I mean, someone might say an idea, right? And you can be like, oh, interesting idea. And then not write it down. Like, yeah. you have the power. Right. Or they might have the idea and then you word it differently. Yeah. Um, but um, that's a little manipulative. I, <laughs> I would suggest, like, somehow talking to your boss or, like, maybe creating a better brainstorm session. But yeah. But uh, I, yeah, I recently, um, within the job that we're, we're at right now, um, uh, Heidi, who was mentioned during the, the Reach Legal episode, She's a, an engineer. She actually went to the, the D school in Stanford and worked oh, wow. at Smart Design. Okay. And I did a brainstorm with her. And and she, you know, uh, the brainstorming that she kind of uh, like led us through was basically, I mean, you show up with imagery, like show up with sort of inspirational imagery. Okay. Uh, I mean, it depends on this type of brainstorm. If it's, it's, it's around something very specific. Right. If it's not early stages. Um, but the idea was everybody would do, everybody would do their, their thing. Her, hers was doing half, half a sheet of paper folded or just like cut, cut in half and eight and a half by 11. Mm -hmm. Um, and you would draw out your idea and, and everybody would be quiet as they were drawing out their ideas. And then, and then at the end, each person would present their idea for that round yes and they would talk about their idea i i think i've done this before or at least i've read about it but yeah essentially the the other method of brainstorming is like individual brainstorm like to yourself quiet for five minutes and then everyone presents and then go back into quiet mode yeah and it's like this back and forth of like group versus individual right group versus, and it, I think that is really helpful because one thing that I, I always find doing the brainstorms is that there are a lot of people that present ideas and, you know, when you're in a meeting setting, you don't want to, like, overstep your boundaries or prolong the meeting by rambling off on some other thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that individual time is really helpful for me to, like, take everyone's concepts and really sift through them in my mind and right. manipulate them and then, you know, elevate them. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's the best kind of brainstorm, especially for the different personality types that you'll often encounter. 
you know, throughout your life. It's like some people are are more vocal and they'll just be like, here's my idea. Like, check it out. Look at it. You know, mm. and and then there are other people who are a bit more reserved about their ideas, but it kind of puts everybody on a level playing field. That's true. That's you true. know to to uh, represent their idea and then you know and then or depict their idea and then talk about it. Right. Um, yeah, and, I mean, I I think that yeah, I mean, those are some good insights for sure. Yeah, but um, you know, in regards to design thinking, you know, I I think that. A lot of disciplines, I, I was saying earlier, outside of design, I think when they think that when they're trying to solve a problem, right? I think people outside of design disciplines think that you have to have the pro the, the solution fully formed in your head right. before you yeah, say anything. They, they think it's like a linear process, like what is the solution, you know, when people don't design think, essentially they would just think and never come up with a solution because the thing with coming up with a solution that solves a problem is that there are this there is this ambiguous stage, this brainstorming fa- phase where you have to sift through these crazy ideas. You have to have this diamond in the rough right. mindset to come up with the solution. Yeah, and I often find for myself, like... Even just generally, like, sifting through my own thoughts in conversation, I, I mean, I have to speak in order to think. Like, I I don't do well um, sort of thinking things through in my head. Oh. Like, things don't, hmm. things do not fully form in my head, and I, and I often need to discuss them in right. order to see where there are... Um, where there are issues or yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like what like you know what resonates and and what is actually good as soon as I can hear the words out of my mouth I can sometimes sometimes hear how dumb they are okay and then I can <laughs> and then I can get to the right you can solution. Correct that's interesting huh because I think I think that that's uh you know that's something that you know we we all think sort of in different ways there are different ways we think there's different ways we learn um you know so that's that for me is the best way that i can think through things is by talking about them right are you are you are you familiar with service design yes okay so i feel like service design is the maybe maybe i'm wrong but is kind of the the flagship designer for design thinking Mm. yeah so service design as as i understand it is I mean, it is what it sounds like. It's about service design. It's it's designing for the service industry, especially. You know, if um, if say I I remember watching a video about this actually, okay. and they and their example was two coffee shops. So if you have two coffee shops and the coffee is the same price and same quality, then the thing that distinguishes one versus the other is the service. Mm-hmm. So that's the entire experience of walking walking into the store, all the touch points, up to the counter, right. buying the coffee, receiving it. All, all of those different touch points are all designed within service design. And you, you might even we might even go to say that that is one of the strongest touch points. I mean, mm-hmm. you, I would pay more for a cup of coffee that had better service. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think service design utilizes design thinking quite a bit in their process. I think it's kind of one of their core their core tools. Um, and I think it, it's I think my biggest beef with design thinking is that it's just the wrong term terminology mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because it's just design. Because you and I could both design the service for a coffee shop. Mm-hmm. We would use the same brainstorming processes. We use the same prototyping processes. Right. We would just implement them into the service arena. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know why the industry has latched onto this buzzword of design thinking, but yeah, I, I, I guess I think it's because it is novel within the design within all industries. Uh, like it's, it's novel within design. Mm. You know, that that there's not, I mean, to my knowledge, uh, I mean, I, I would, I feel like I would include engineering into this, like any sort of, 
any sort of career where you are creating something from nothing, you know, there's there's a level of design thinking that goes into that. Right. Right. But for but for other industries where they're trying to solve organizational problems. Oh, like okay, marketing. Okay, so I I think I understand what you're saying. They might not have the same process, but the process might be valuable for them. Uh, see, now I've come full circle. Maybe I think design thinking is okay. <laughs> So essentially what you're saying, James, is that design thinking isn't necessarily for us because we already know how to design. Design thinking is for, you know, marketers or lawyers. Yeah. Someone who, who doesn't understand design but can take this design thinking, you know, methodology and implement it into their work. Exactly. Well, I've come full circle. You, <laughs> you've convinced me. I had I'm, this beef. I was like, James, we're going to talk about design thing on the podcast because I, he, I think it's wrong. I, there was I, smoke I, coming out of your ears and your nose. And then you're like, Nick, just sit. Hey, let me tell you. Let me tell you what design thinking yeah, is. Yeah, sit down on my lap, Nick. Let me let me tell hmm. you a story. Interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I I don't know. I think I think it's called design thinking because it's it's basically a storytelling. Uh, like it's storytelling from the name hmm. to say this is how designers design. Right. This is the way in which they they think about it. Right. While, while they're designing, and so it's it's just a a relatable way to talk to people outside of design. Yeah. Um, about how to tackle complex problems. I think. Yeah, I think that is. James, you just showed me up. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I don't know. There, there are articles like there's an article on Fastco about design thinking is BS. Um, it, it's like an op ed by somebody from, yeah. uh, like, a, uh, I think a partner at Pentagram. I, I, I will say, I do think there is still, there's an overuse of the term. There is definitely an overuse of the term. It's definitely a buzzword. And I think people often pat themselves on the back for saying like, we teach design thinking, or we engage in design thinking. It but they does, really don't. It does feel like a little snooty mm-hmm. in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to make one amendment. I think service design also expands beyond just the the service industry. Like right, the right, industry, it does. Into more, you know, logistical things. But because uh, I know we'll probably get that email. It's like, service design isn't about coffee shops, guys. <laughs> No, but yeah, I, I, I've I've seen uh, like it has a like you know government work mm-hmm, for sure uh, a lot of but it but it's about it's about touch points and service like right. it, it's about, about experience service yeah, yeah. and experience mm-hmm. yeah exactly um but yeah I think that's that's a I'm glad you could shed some light on the topic James because all I was doing was hating on design thing <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I I think it's time to get some some questions yes um. Thanks for sending in questions, guys. If you had any, feel free to send them to minordetailspodcast at gmail.com. Um, our first question comes from Paul O. And Paul O. writes, Where do you guys draw the line between a clever idea and a genuine, genuinely innovative one? Lots of design sites like Yanko or Fastco may go viral for their clever idea ideas they post, but it is not something necessarily innovative or game-changing. Mm. Thoughts? Thoughts? I, I mean, I, I kind of touched on this uh, when we were talking about quirky because I I feel like the fine line... Yeah, when when Paul says clever, I also think of sort of like novelty. Yeah. Um, it's it's often that, that sort of product that combines two into one. I I have a whole thing. Like, my, my wife knows this. I hate anything reversible. I think... Do one oh. thing, do one thing. So like reversible jackets. Yes. Do one thing and do it well. Like don't don't try to do, you know, don't try to do like James, do you like the pants that were also zip off shorts? I actually did wear them, but I wore them so much, the the shorts part of it, and they were washed so many times that then come winter when I zipped on the pants, it was like it, they were like shades darker That's than funny. the shorts. Wow. I mean, I, I could have started a trend there. That could have been some some advanced color blocking. Right, right. Um, but um, but no, I, I feel like a lot of times uh, we would call this in uh, housewares 
uh, or kitchen wares, we would call this plus ones. And, and it would be the design plus another feature. Right. It's a Swiss army knife. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Swiss army knife is like plus 15. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, so this was, I mean, there are some times where it makes sense. So like a can opener, you have this big metal face. Right. And if you can punch out of it something that could open a bottle, like why not? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's kind of up for grabs. Um, my feeling is, is that as long as it feels integrated in the design, like the, the weird thing is, is that growing up, we had a can opener that had a bottle opener and I just assumed that all can openers had bottle openers. And, but then I got to my first job and there were can openers that were just can openers and I was, I, my mind was blown. (laughs) Oh man. I, yeah, that's... (laughs) The thing with having a novelty product, like a clever, like, just like, oh, add a bottle opener, you know, whatever it is, mm-hmm. um, versus something that's actually innovative, is I actually think that line is a very fine line. Oh, it's super fine. You're almost splitting hairs at that point. And I, me personally, I I ride that line with all my products <laughs> because that's that's where the gold is. I mean, to create an innovative design, Yeah. sometimes you do have to ride that line. You know, mm-hmm. I've done like, I did a dog toy that it was also, it was a ball, but it also unraveled to a rope toy. Mm. And yeah, it was a little bit clever novelty, but it wasn't obtrusive right? in the way that, you know, some novelty products are. It was a great design. It was integrated. Yeah. And because of that, I like to think it fell on the innovative side. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a very fine line. It's interesting kind of like going back to your lamp. Mm-hmm. Like, is it clever or is it innovative? And I mean, I guess an innovative product, um, like what is the definition of an innovative product? Does it does it provide something new to you that you never had before, but makes your life more efficient? Yes. Um, I, I would say Yes. It, mm-hmm. it makes your life more efficient, and then a clever product doesn't. But it is still new and cool. Yeah. I I think that both products are admirable. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm of the opinion, you know me, you know my right. design philosophy. I'm all about delightful. Right. If it makes someone smile, that's great. Yeah. And I think that, like, you see a clever idea online... And it makes you smile. Like, you know, it might not be innovative. It might not be an iPhone. Right. Like, when I saw the iPhone for this first time, it didn't make me smile. James. But it made me... I think... Here's the difference between a clever... Here's the difference between clever and innovative. James, you know what... Innovative... Let me... Let me finish. Innovative makes your jaw drop. Clever makes you smile. Mmm. That's a good... That's... Yeah. That's good, James. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. But also, remember when Steve got up there and he was like pinched to Zoom? Remember that? That was good. Yeah, you went. Oh. Yeah. Jaw drop. Jaw drop. Innovative. Yeah. Okay. Jaw drop, mic drop. But you didn't smile. I didn't smile. Got it. I understand your philosophy yeah. now. Yeah, I think, I think. yeah, maybe there's a gasp as well. But yeah. <gasps> oh, my gosh. Like, I don't actually, you know, thinking about it, Elon Musk, like, I, I like I don't know that anything has necessarily made my jaw drop yet from yeah. Elon. I don't know if I, I don't know if Elon Musk is well, I mean SpaceX. Space well, yes, the the SpaceX rockets that, la- that like landing, landing yeah, yeah. that made my jaw drop. Right. The Tesla cars, right. nothing has like nothing's made my jaw drop. PayPal, whatever. Yeah. PayPal is is nice. I I enjoy using it. Right. But uh, what about the uh, boring company, the whole company where he dig- digs holes? Well, once that is Hyperloop? actually real, once that's a real thing, I, my jaw will drop. Like I, I can imagine being. I don't know if I've told you this story before, but I think this this would be similar to to the boring company or or going down into into those tunnels underneath L.A. If okay. that ever happens, right. I, uh, I took a train from Berlin to Copenhagen okay. when I was traveling through Europe f- like five years ago. And the train got onto a ferry and went across like, you know, this expanse of water 
landed in Denmark, from Germany to Denmark, and then got off of the ferry and back onto the tracks. You are lying right now. I see it. This no, is I'm not. Fake. This is no, so I'm fake. not. I never. This, this, a train can't fit in a ferry. Did it spiral up like a little snake? No, the, the train really was only ferry? like maybe five cars long. This is insanity. But it was amazing. This podcast has gone off the rails onto a, <laughs> onto a ferry. <laughs> it's true. I I got off of the train and I was in uh, the ferry. And I was walking around the ferry. I was walking around the boat, up deck, up on top of the deck. All right. And then got back into the train and the train got back on the tracks. I am going to research this and it, we will post pictures. It's real. It's yeah, wow. It's real. Hmm. And it was amazing. Jaw dropper. Wow. Um, but yeah, I I think that that I think that's your difference. I like that. I like I like the jaw drop versus the smile. That's a good difference. See, I never would have come up with that in my head. You had to talk. I had, you had to talk to, about you had to speak it. Speak about. Speak it out. That's that's how I work. Oh man, thanks, Paulo. That was good. We're making some progress on the podcast today. Yes. Um, we got an, another question coming in. I don't know if you want to read it, James. Oh, uh, Max Rose or uh, at Maxel Rose on Instagram. He was trying to send this message to us on our last major details, but for some reason it wasn't coming through. Yeah, that was weird, wasn't I it? I think it was because of crude language or something. <laughs> um, but uh, Max asks, how do you think industrial design as a profession slash field has been affected by its association with art, i.e. lots of ID programs are at art schools? Do you think this association has been helpful or harmful? This is an interesting question because sometimes I think that design is almost celebrated as a science. Mm -hmm. It's almost elevated to the sense of like there's this process. It needs to solve world hunger, you know, blah, 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 blah. Whereas art is the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Art is whatever you make of it. You know, mm. it's completely subjective. Technically, everything could be art um, in in some definitions. And in my opinion, design is an art form. I consider it an art because it is subjective. It is. Right. It does have a lot of ambiguity into it. Yeah. Um, but it's it's the crossroad between art and science. Yeah. It's the crossroad between those structures. Yeah, I think I told this story before, but I noticed a... a, a big difference between the Southern District Conference IDSA when I was in school versus I visited the Northern District Conference. And I felt like the Northern District was much more on the arts side. Yeah. Whereas the Southern District was much more on the science side. I, and why is that? I we, I don't know if we had a good answer for that. I, I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, I don't know if it's as a result of trickling down from the Midwest, like the manufacturing hub mm. into the, like into the South, um, you know, because the North, it makes a lot of sense to me. You have, you know, you have flourishing art scenes right. within all the major cities. It's, it's almost like, I almost think of it as like this more of a elitist type of idea. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm over. Play that. more. I don't know if I'm I'm going into some sort of political thing or not. But I I think uh, I always imagine the North having more of a uh, liberal viewpoint of the world. Uh huh. Um, and being more into the arts. Yeah. So that's why I think design schools up north tend to lean into more of a artistic design philosophy mm -hmm. whereas in the south it's a little bit more conservative and very a little bit more structured yeah more more, rigid. more research based more you know yeah. des design back to design thinking you know? yeah yeah i um yeah i i it was interesting to me because i remember at virginia tech how much it was kind of like beaten into us like you know you it, it felt like you shouldn't even consider yourself an artist mm -hmm. it was it was so much more about the methodology yes and i feel and like that's how it was a scat too like yeah but i feel like as a result of living and working in new york for the past five six years i've adopted almost more of the artist mentality i i personally 
feel like I am more of the artist mentality. Yeah. For sure. I I enjoy that aspect of not necessarily adhering to the process, not necessarily right. like rigidly solving the problem, but adding that element of surprise, like you're saying, or delight mm-hmm. that's not necessarily, you know, needed, but, yeah. but adds to the design as a whole. And right. Creates... Because, because art as, as a, you know, a field is not necessarily needed. Yeah. Like we don't, we, but, but is it in a way like we, we generate art, we love art. Yeah. Like, you know, you go to a museum on the weekend and, and weekends and it's jam packed. Yeah. People, I remember going to see the Mona Lisa in, in France and just like, you know, I mean, there's Crouts. novelty around, Crouts. around Mo- the Mona Lisa, but. I, I remember know, I remember going to the Mona Lisa and we when I was in Paris we got there before the museum opened mm-hmm. the Louvre and right when it opened everyone rushed in everyone was running yeah running down the hall skipping everything everything just to see the Mona Lisa right right I got there first <laughs> <laughs> but you know we were talking about this sort of awe inspiring when it comes to innovation and I think there's also awe-inspiring design when it comes to the artistic side of design for sure when it comes to the form when it comes you know because i feel like great art kind of shows what people are capable of in a in a creative expressive sense yeah rather than um in science where it shows what people are capable of in like a mental thinking right logical yeah yeah Yeah. i i I, the the thing with design is that if you don't have that creative aspect, that artistic touch, I don't think it's design. You yeah. Know, it, design is subjective to some extent. Like, you have to be able to implement your artistic capabilities, whether that be, you know, creating some sort of clever idea or delightful thing. Maybe it's just the composition that you create is beautiful. Like, you have to implement that in, yeah. into the product. Like, that is industrial design. Right. That's the definition. So, I, I think it's correct that industrial design is in art school i don't think it should be a scientific uh degree Mm. well i have an ms in design oh i have a bfa (laughs) or or bs sorry uh we both oh my god but but i i think that i think that design is the venn diagram between science and art yeah for sure um so yeah. And minor details is the Venn diagram between you and me. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's our, oh, that's our tagline. Oh, that sounds sexual. Oh man. Um so yeah, thanks for sending that in, Max. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Nick? Yeah, uh, we, we got another question in from Josh Jones, and he says, I've just finished high school and starting design school in the UK. The university offers language classes in the evening and i was thinking about taking mandarin i'm under the impression that this could be really useful to myself as a designer in the future and improve my job prospects uh, as many products are manufactured in china do you guys think that my assumptions are right or would i be wasting my time learning mandarin listen you're not ever wasting your time if you're learning something and fair could his time be better utilized? Uh, I don't think so. No, I I think that you think Mandarin is the best utilization. I think well, I mean, not of all of his time. Okay, but some of his time. If he's genuinely interested in, like, it sounds like if he's even kind of like peeking into it, he's interested in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are a lot of designers. I know. Um, I don't know if Karim Rashid like. I know he has an office in China now that does industrial design. I don't know that he does any industrial design in New York anymore. Like, he doesn't no, no, have no, a he, team. No, he does. Mm-hmm. Of, well, I mean, I know some of the team personally. So, Oh, okay. Because okay. I know that he opened up a Shanghai, okay. I think, office. And then also Stefano Giovanoni has an office in China. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't think, I don't think it's a bad idea. Like, I just think that if it starts to consume more time, because if you're starting design school, a lot of your time is going to be spent on design. Right. You know, so is it going to take away from that? Is it going to, uh, yeah, take up more time than than it should? So I think 
in theory, in theory, it seems like a solid idea, right? In theory, it seems like, oh, if I can talk to the manufacturers that manufacture my product, I'll come up with better designs. Um, in practice, I don't know if it's necessarily that linear or clear. Mm-hmm. I almost feel like there is a there. There seems like there's always an interim person that has that job right. of translating and communicating that design. It, I, I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's bad that you you want to learn Mandarin. I don't think it's bad that you want to close that gap. I think it is useful. Um, do I think it's the most optimal? Like if I was going to spread a, everything that I could and figure out what I could do to improve my design education, would I choose Mandarin as one of those options? I don't think it would be the top option. Yeah, but I but but kind of digging into this question, I think that if there is a curiosity there and a genuine curiosity and sort of a thirst for knowledge yeah. underlying this question then pursue it. I fully support that as well. Yeah, if you just if you feel like you're interested, do it because that's the most important thing. Yeah. I also I also will say one more thing is that the world is constantly changing, constantly moving. Yeah. In 10 years, will China be the manufacturing hub? Africa is quickly becoming a very hot manufacturing hub for China itself. Mm. And as China raises as a as a world power, you know, it's slowly, you know, it's it's been predicted for several years, but pe- people think that China will become the top world power and surpass right. America. Right. Um, you know, what what will that be now? Will China off uh, push off their manufacturing to Africa? Right. Um, yeah, as they rise to, like, sort of, you know, more substantial middle class. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's very likely. Think, things to think about. You know, don't think about, like, right now. Think about... 10 years out. Yeah. And also, you got those earbuds from Google that'll translate everything for you. <laughs> yeah. And 10 years out, will we need to learn new languages or will yeah. it all already be translated for us? Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. Good question, Josh. Hope, hope that helps. Um, of course, every week we like to give a shout out to one Instagrammer who we think is doing some interesting work. And this week, I found this guy last night. Oof. And I, I, you know, I'm addicted to Instagram. I just scroll through. And I found this guy. He's popping balloons. His name is Jan Erickson, uh, and his Instagram handle is at J A N, and then E R I C H S O N. We'll link to it minordetailspodcast.com. Um, but yeah, he's all he does. He he's almost a performance artist, right? I would call his work a mix, mixture between performance art and Dadaism. Yeah. Um, he just pops balloons with weird machines. It's amazing. When Nick was first describing it to me, I said, Nick, this sounds like some some fetish stuff. Yeah. But when he showed it to me, I was delighted. Yeah, be prepared. <laughs> if you look him up, you're about to spend the next half hour of your life scrolling through his Instagram. It's so good. It is really good. He doesn't only pop balloons. He smashes bananas. Yes. He also knocks coffee cups off the table that's that those are some of my favorites <laughs> the coffee cup one coffee cups ones are good but um but yeah it it's interesting we thought we'd shed some light on some more uh artistic well I, artistic I, instagrams yeah. and i think um you know I, I think there's a good uh sort of lesson in iteration there yeah you know mm-hmm. it's it's just iterating on how to pop a balloon right and it's awesome yeah there's some design thinking behind all oh, this. Oh, yeah. Bring it, bring it full circle. <laughs> bring it full post-its circle. post-its all over his walls. Oh, man. So check him out. Um, we'll link to him and everything. Of course, you can uh, check out everything on our website, MeyerDetailsPodcast.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely go subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yeah. We've been doing videos. And what else? Google. Apple Podcast. Apple Podcast. Subscribe, rate. Give us the five stars, you know, all that, all that, all that good stuff. <laughs> because we told you to. Don't say that. If you give us five stars, say that because, because you like the podcast. Really. Right. <laughs> um, oh, and then our, our music by Kyoshi the Kid. Oh. Good stuff. And uh, yeah, I'm at Nick P. Baker. And I'm at I Draw and Receipts. 
All right. See you later, guys. Later.